The warm June Florentine sun flooded his face as he gazed out the window at the tawny stone tower house of the superintendent of the Florentine guilds. Returning from Rome with no commissions and no funds, he had been obliged to send Argento back to his family's farm outside Ferrara and himself returned to his father's board. However, he occupied the front and best room of the commodious apartment in which the Buonarotti now lived, for Lodovico had invested some part of the Rome earnings to good advantage. He had bought a small house in San Pietro Maggiore, used the income from it to clear the title to the disputed Buonarotti par property near Santa Croce, then raised the family's social position by renting this floor in this house in the more fashionable street of St. Proculus, a block from the superb stone pile of the Pazzi Palace. The death of Lucrezia had aged Lodovico. His face was thinner, the cheeks sunken. In a compensation, he had allowed his, fam his hair to grow in a thick mass down to his shoulders. As Jacopo Galli had predicted, nothing had come of the business Michelangelo had hoped to set up for Buonarato and Giov Giovan Simone. Buonarato had at last settled down in the Strozzi wool shop near the Porta Rosa. Giovan Simone was a crushed youth up apathetically taking jobs, then disappearing after a few weeks. Sigismondo, barely able to read and write, was earning a few scudi as a hired soldier for Florence in its present hostilities against Pisa. Leonardo had disappeared, now I knew into what monastery. His aunt Cassandra and uncle Francesco were beset with minor ills. He and Granacci had clasped each other in a hilarious embrace, happy to be together. During the past years, Granacci had come into the first half of his fortune and, as the gossip Jacopo of the Gerlandio Bottega reported gleefully, was keeping a mistress in a villa in the hills of Bolasguaro above the Porta Romana. Granacci still maintained his headquarters at Gerlandio's, helping out David Gerlandio after his brother Benedetto's death in return for using the studio for his own work. He riffled through the sketches on Michelangelo's work table. Open for business, I see. Best stocked shop in Florence. Any customers? None. I'm joining Saji. Granacci chuckled. He's been quite a success. Just, just bought space for a butcher shop in the new market. The Bertoldo method of carving calves. They set out for an osteria under the trees, turn left on the Via del Procosolo, past the gracious body of church into the Borgo dei Gracci, with its serastori palace designed by Baccio Dagnolo, and, the, and, and into the Via dei Benci. Here were the ancient Gebelin Bardelli Palace and the first one of the Alberti Palaces, with its columned courtyard and its capitals by Giuliano de San Gallo. Florence spoke to him. The stones spoke to him. He felt their character, the variety of structures, the strength of their impacted layers. How wonderful to be back where Pietra Serena was the material of architecture. To some people, stone was dead. Hard as stone, stone cold, they said. To him, as he once again ran his fingers along its contours, it was the most alive substance in the world. Rhythmic, responsive, tractable. Warm, resilient, colorful, vibrant, he was in love with stone. The restaurant was on the Lunga, Lungarno, located in a garden shade, shaded by fig trees. The owner, who was also the cook, went down to the river, raised a basket of ropes on ropes, wiped off a bottle of Trebbiano on his apron, and opened it at the table. They drank to Michelangelo's return. He climbed the familiar Centignano Hills to see the Topolinos found that Bruno and Enrico had married. Each had added a stone room for his new family on the far side of the house. Already there were five grandchildren, and both wives were again pregnant. He commented, The Topolinos are going to control all the Pietra Serena carving of Florence if you keep up this pace. We'll keep up, said Bruno. The mother added, Your friend, Contessina de' Medici, she too had another son after her daughter died. He had already learned that Contessina had been banished from Florence and lived in exile with her husband and son in a peasant's house on the north slope of Fiesole. 
their home and possessions having been confiscated when her father-in-law, Niccolo Ridolfi, was hanged for participating in a conspiracy to overthrow the Republic and bring Piero back as King of Florence. His affection for Contessina had not changed, though the years had passed without his seeing her. He had never felt wanted at the Ridolfi Palace, and so he had not gone to visit. How then could he go to her after his return from Rome? When she was living in poverty and disgrace, might not any visit now that they were plagued by misfortune be consumed as pity? The city itself had undergone many perceivable changes in the almost five years he had been gone. Walking through the Piazza della Signora, the people bowed their heads in shame when they passed the spot where Savonarola's body had been burned. At the same time, they were unsmothered, smothering their consciences under a tornado of activity, trying to replace what Savonarola had destroyed. Spending large sums with the gold and silversmiths, the, the gem cutters, the costume makers, the embroiderers, designers of terracotta and wood mosaics, the makers of musical instruments, the manuscript illuminators, Piero Sodorini, whom Lorenzo de' Medici had trained as the brightest of the young men in politics, and whom Michelangelo had been had often seen at the palace, was now at the head of the Florentine Republic as Gonfalonier as of or mayor governor of Florence and the city state. He had achieved a measure of harmony among the Florentine factions for the first time since the mortal between since the mortal battle between Lorenzo and Savonarola had begun. Florentine artists who had fled the city, had sensed the upsurge of activity, and returned from Milan, Venice, Portugal, Paris, Piero de Cosimo, Filippo Lippi, Andrea Sansovino, Benedetto de Rov Rovezzano, Leonardo da Vinci, Benedetto Bulliano, Bulliani. Those whose work had been stopped by Savonarola's influence and power were not producing again. Botticelli, Pololo, the architect known as Il Cronac Cronaca, the storyteller, Rosalie, Roselli Lorenzo de Credi, Baccio de Monto, Montelupo, jester and scandal bearer of the Medici sculpture garden. They had organized company of the cauldron, and while it was restricted to only twelve members, each was allowed to bring four guests to the monthly dinner meeting in Rostici's enormous sculpture studio. Grinacci was a member. He had immediately invited Michelangelo to accompany him. Michelangelo had refused, preferring to wait until he had a commission. The months since his return had contained little real pleasure. He had left for Rome a boy, returned a man, ready to carve mountains of marble. But as he, re as he turned to gaze sightlessly at his Madonna and child and centaurs, which he had affixed on, his, on nails to the sidewall of, of his combination workroom and bedroom, he thought unhappily that as far as Florence knew he might never have carved the Bacchus or Pietà. Jacopo Galli was still working for him in Rome. The Muscron brothers from Bur Bruges, who imported cloth from England into Rome, had seen the Pietà and were interested in a Madonna and child. Galli thought he could secure an excellent contract on the Muscron's next visit to Rome. He had also interested in Cardinal P Piccoli Piccolomini in employing Michelangelo to carve the figures needed to complete the family altar, honoring his uncle Pope Pius II in the cathedral in Siena. Without Galli, he muttered, I'm out of business. While the grass is growing, the horse starves. Immediately on his return, he had gone to the Duomo workshop to study the 17-foot shield column, called by some a thin piece by others, emaciated. To search... To search its innerness for ideas, testing it again and reiterating to Beppe. Il marmo et sano. The marble is sound. At night he read by candlelight in Dante and in the Old Testament, looking for a mood and a heroic theme. Then he learned that the members of the Wood Guild and the board on the works of the cathedral had been unable to make up their minds about the carving of the giant block. It was just as well, thought Michelangelo, for he also had heard that many favored giving the commission to Leonardo da, Vin da Vinci, recently returned to Florence because of the magnificent reputation of his huge equestrian statue of the Count Sforza and his pa painting of the Last Supper in the refectory of the Santa Maria del Grazie in Milan. Michelangelo had never met Leonardo, who had abandoned Florence for Milan some 18 years before, after being acquitted on a morals charge. 
but Florence, but Florentine artists were saying that he was the greatest draftsman in Italy. Nettled, curious, Michelangelo had gone to Santissima An Annunziata when the cartoon for Leonardo's Virgin and Child in St. Anne was on exhibition. He had stood before the cartoon with his heart beating like a hammer. Never had he seen such power on authenticity of drawing such forceful truth about the figure, except, of course, in his own work, in a folio, on a bench, he had found the sketch of a male nude seen from the rear, with arms and legs outstretched. No one had rendered the male figure in this fashion, so galvanically alive and convincing. Leonardo, he was certain, had dissected. He had pulled the bench up in front of the three figures and plunged into the copying, had left the church chastened. And the boards granted the commission to Leonardo, who could contest their decision? Could he, with only a few reports of his Bacchus and Pieta, beginning to filter northward to indiv indicate his stature? Then Leonardo had rejected the commission, on the grounds that he despised marble sculpture as an inferior art. Good only for artists, artisans, Michelangelo heard the news in a state of turmoil. He was glad to have the Duccio block free, and Leonardo da, da, da Vinci out of, the, out of the running, but he felt a resentment against the man for his be, belittling statement, which all Florence took up and was repeating. One darkness before dawn he rose, dressed hurriedly, ran through the empty Via del Pro, Pro, Proconsolo to the Dormo workshop, and stood at the corner of the column. The diagonal beams of his first sunlight streamed across the marble, projecting his shadow upward, the full seventeen-foot length of the column magnifying his silhouette and turning him into a giant. He caught his breath, thought of David as he knew his story from the Bible. This is how David must have felt, he told himself on that morning, when he stepped forth to face Goliath, a giant for the symbol of Florence. He returned home, reread the ch David chapter with heightened perception. For days he drew from memory virile male figures seeking a David worthy of the biblical legend. He submitted design after design to his former Medici palace acquaintance, Gonfo Gonfolienier Sodorini, to the Wool Guild, to the Board of Works of the Cathedral. But nothing happened. He was stalemated, and he was burning up with marble fever.